I think the irony is a key part of Southern identity. I think that that contradiction is something that if you're living in the South, you're living with all the time. And what could I possibly mean by that? What about the South having the, some of the lowest investments in public education or social services ever historically in the United States and yet also having such a significant impact on culture? I mean, think, for instance, of music. Um, it could very easily be argued that there's not a region of the country that's had quite the effect on music from blues to jazz to rock and roll that the South has. And that's in the midst of major poverty, in the midst of a, of a depreciated uh, level of social services and a quality of life historically. Tennessee, for instance, has the highest percentage of minimum wage workers in the country uh, as a state. Percentage of minimum wage workers. And we also have some of the richest politicians. That's ironic. <laughs> it's ironic. <laughs> it's also ironic that, that what you said about, you know, um, education and health care and different things being at the bottom and us being in the Bible Belt. You know, what, what does that say about our religion? It's a very good point. Tennessee got a report card out of Washington insofar as women's issues are concerned. And we're a D in all, everything except jobs. And there we're a C plus. Let me give you a historical example of the South. Uh, in the 1930s and 1940s, because of disenfranchisement, poll taxes, and the like, at the US Congress, the oldest serving legislators were almost invariably from the South because they can continuously get re-elected. And so because of the lack of democracy in the South and the lack of participation and the control, the greatest amount of concentration of power in the U.S. Congress is actually to a large degree among Southern legislators. That political power to a certain degree came out of that lack of democracy. That's a certain ironic sentiment a bitter irony, I guess you could say. When we're talking about Southern iconography or slang, um, why is it pulling this out of the ether? It's not coming out of nowhere. The bitter Southerner is actually a, you could say, a trope, or it, it's a catchphrase. Uh, and it denotes a past or being in the middle of something. You can't be bitter about something that never happened. So, <coughs> what does it mean? <laughs> I mean, with, okay, with, with Wyatt, with Wayne White, okay, he's a man who, he didn't leave Hicks in Tennessee because he was having a great time. He had to go somewhere else to do what he wanted, but once he got there, he became, he, he became the Southerner. And I think there's a certain bitterness in that. And I think that's why the comedy, this is, this is all supposed to be funny. I mean, he said it himself. This is supposed to be like Richard Pryor fun. Uh, this is not supposed to be like he's bitter, but there's a certain bitterness to have to leave your home and then look back at it from the thing. But, you know, I think he got a nice response uh, when he came home. Anyway, but I think that's part of him as well. Who's bitter are the, are, to me would be African Americans, people who are the minimum wage earners, and in their eyes, probably that the South actually won the war in a sense. If you're looking at Jim Crow and all of that, to me, it's not it, to them. I mean, there wasn't the war was not won necessarily or lost. And so I think a lot of the bitterness is not necessarily. We have to remember that for um, African Americans, we did not lose the Civil War. I mean, that's that was a good thing. But what happened later, or Jim Crow and all of that. That would make me better, for sure. That is a perfect point. For Confederates, a certain degree of bitterness for losing the war and for Reconstructionists and everybody looking for a more progressive South, there's a bitterness that we lost the peace. For me, what sticks out to me most about this is, uh, is making fun of an imposed social identity in the South. Uh, and I think it's I was born and bred in Chattanooga. My family's got roots here. 
Um, and knowing a little bit about the story, especially of East Tennessee, there is a sense of this gratuitous stamp on the South of the Confederacy that the South, the, the history of the South was the history of the Confederacy. Um, and, you know, that was very contentious. One of my favorite historians of the Civil War, David Williams, uh, he wrote a People's History of the Civil War. He says that in many ways, the Civil War wasn't just a war between the North and the South, but actually a war between the South and the South. And I think there is no better example of that than where you are here in East Tennessee. East Tennessee was highly contentious. You know, how, you folks know that uh, there were two actual votes for secession in Tennessee, and in none, neither one of those, Hamilton County actually voted to secede. The first vote, there were only two counties in all of East Tennessee that actually voted to secede. And when the actual vote in June came through, uh, East Tennessee voted two-thirds against. It's complicated. When Jefferson Davis was coming back into town uh, after having relinquished his seat in the U.S. Congress, he's going around on train and preaching secession all the way back down to Mississippi. And he stops at the Crutchfield House at the side of the Reed House here and begins to preach secession. At which point, one of the owners comes out and calls him a yellow traitor um, because of heavy Unionist sentiment in the area. At which point, guns get drawn and supporters of the two figureheads have to rush them all off to safety before one of them dies. So it was contentious. A little contentious. But there's also a contradiction here in the South, here in Hamilton County, um, with support for the Union. William Cliff, for example, was the head of the militia here in Hamilton County. And uh, when the secession vote came through, he's actually organizing up in his farm and plantation. He's a plantation owner that owns slaves. He's organizing people across the region in order to pick up arms against the Confederacy. And uh, he actually becomes a leader in the bridge burning ex expedition to cripple the Confederacy. After that fails, he goes up to Kentucky and uh, enlists in the Federal Army to come back down here and be fighting. He wasn't the only one. Alfred Tate from Ottawa uh, was the son of one of the largest plantation owners in East Tennessee. He was a slave owner himself and yet fought for the Union. And afterwards, he becomes the radical Republican legislature for Hamilton County and actually crafts the legislation for the state militia to protect newly enfranchised black voters across Tennessee. Now that's kind of a contradiction, right? A little strange. Not to mention the fact of the experience of the many black southerners. Uh, one wonderful example that I can give is the story in the Daily Rebel of a slave that swims across the Tennessee River right across his landing as soon as the Federal Army comes through and reaches his freedom. And the Daily Rebel reports that within a week, he's organizing newly freed slaves to enlist in the military and marching back and forth in plain sight of the Confederates. Um, for many of those people, that was uh, a, a very firm line in the sand for Union sentiment. That's count contraband. That's right. Certainly, you can say that the difference uh, directly after the Civil War, it's not something that can easily be stamped with the CSA flag. Population of Chattanooga at the time that the Civil War started was only 2,500 people. By the end of the Civil War, there's somewhere between six and 8,000 refugees and uh, newly escaped slaves just on, in Hill City in the North Shore. That has a dramatic effect on what city we live in today. A dramatic effect. This is my, I think, my favorite piece that we're going to be discussing. Beauty is embarrassing. Embarrassing, I guess, <laughs> the best way to put it. Y'all take away that. It seems that, at least in Chattanooga, uh, in whatever, the last 10, 20, 30 years since the Renaissance, it's the opposite. Beauty is a commodity. And it's the opposite of embarrassing. It's something that we, it's our brand, in a sense, is how beautiful Chattanooga is. Um, the reality of Chattanooga, or the multi-layers of Chattanooga, 
try to cover it up with the veneer of some of the natural beauty. Let's move to that. As a couple of people here said, nothing up here reminds me more of Chattanooga than this picture right here. And that is because of what gets covered up. The public image, the modern image of Chattanooga based off of what is before, um, what folks don't know or what doesn't get conveyed. Did anybody, uh, a couple months back, Times Free Press here locally did a major investigative story called The Lost Way about the Chattanooga Renaissance? Yes. How many people had a chance to read that? A few folks. Well, they go in and uh, they try to re-examine how the Renaissance started, this major turn-in investment downtown um, that started with Chattanooga Venture. One of the most interesting things that stuck out to me about that story was a meeting early on that was held at the house of one of the participants in which they come up with a plan and they're discussing how to change. And the goal of the project is defined as creating a city without history. We're going to start out. We're going to tabula rasa all of this. Plain slate. We're going to start out. Now why would why would you want to do that? What is it that you're avoiding when you do that? And now we're the best outdoor town in America, quote unquote. Yeah. You just bookended the, what seems to be the entire PR story of Chattanooga right there. <laughs> I think that they were trying to dispel the notion that a handful of privileged people controlled what happened and what didn't happen in the city. And that was why the entire idea of the participation of the community evolved. And the point of that series was that it's gone now and it has returned to what they thought they were erasing to a large extent. Very good point. It was also the thing that they, they had the moment. It's like Chicago after the fire bulldozed it all and, and rebuilt it, laid the streets out straight and made an ability to be a, uh, at least a visually impressive city. I think that's what they felt like they had at the time and they did. You know, what are, you can argue about what has happened, but at the time it was a unique moment. Yes, it was the was. possibility of progress. Yes. Sir. And a lot of wonderful things came from it. Because the city today is not the city that it was in 1980 when that process began. But there was a lot of money before you tore down all your factories. That was new money. That's real money. Not the service industry. That's just churning what's on the table. So what are the parts of the story in Chattanooga that are covered up or that have been erased that don't get told or don't get highlighted? Well, what are we leaving out? Uh, well, certainly, you know, racism. Race relations, and that was certainly something they wanted to change the canvas about because they just uh, went through the whole busing issue here in Chattanooga in the '70s, and so um, people were at odds with one another, and uh, they wanted to turn the page from that. How many people have heard that? Desegregation and civil rights in Chattanooga was relatively calm. Take, a, take an example. J.B. Stoner. J.B. Stoner is considered possibly one of the worst racist and white supremacists ever in the history of the segregated South. Uh, he uh, was from Chattanooga at the age of 16. He refounded the Klan local here in 1942. Um, he goes on to found a party called the Stoner Anti-Jewish Party. After the World War II, this local dude says that he wants to out Hitler Hitler. Um, he goes around the South and supports Klan movement and activity in bombings, dynamiting, arson, violence, some of the worst aspects. And by the 70s, he actually runs for a Georgia state legislature seat uh, and Georgia governor, and he gets 70,000 votes after he was saying he wanted to out Hitler, Hitler, he actually gets convicted in 1983 of being involved in the bombing of Bethel Baptist Church in Birmingham. That is a, that's a local story that 
perhaps doesn't want to get talked about. In fact, our organization, Chattanooga Organized for Action, is part of our People's History Project. We did some investigation of, of violence early on in, during what we call the beginning of the civil rights era, 1957 to 1960. We found 18 instances of bombings, arson, and violence that are taking place, were taking place right here in Chattanooga. In fact, it got so bad that the mayor actually had to call down the FBI to help against what he described as organized terrorists. Not exactly a story that a lot of folks in Chattanooga are familiar with. What about the Klan shooting on Martin Luther King Boulevard or 9th Street at the time? How many people are familiar with that? 1980, uh, local folks with the Klan, some of them had grad recently graduated from Red Bank High School. Uh, local leaders in the Klan actually get drunk and try to light a burning cross right in the middle of the Black Commercial District. And then they get frustrated because it fails. They can't light it because they're all drunk. And so they're frustrated, they get in their car, and they drive down the street and pull out a shotgun and shoot five black women as they're coming out of the bar or out of their home. Then they get acquitted by an all-white jury. Excuse me. Yes. I had a friend who was on that jury. He did not sympathize with the shooters. He said that the prosecution made such a bad case that there was no way they could find them guilty even though they knew they were guilty. So I don't think we should automatically damn the jury when we don't know the whole story. That's a very important point. It's true. And it's part of the system. Um, actually, it was found out later that the prosecution actually withheld evidence from the trial in which the Klan, uh, in a letter, said that they wanted to instill, institute a race war uh, at the time. And the prosecution felt that that would be, um, it, it would have an undue effect on the jury if that information was shared. It might find them guilty. Yeah. No, that Johnson. And for the first time, the story was being told in its entirety. And I moved here from the north. Somebody told me that there had been a man hanged on the Longa Street Grid, lynched and hanged. And I knew nothing more about it except that. And I shuddered and I moved on. And it wasn't until the last two years that the story now is emerging and public awareness is growing. And there will be, ultimately, not only a monument commemorating his death and those of the others who were lynched there and killed, but also um, encouraging black individuals to pursue the law because it was two black attorneys, unknown to me, and I don't know how many people in this room know that. It was two black attorneys that took that case to the Supreme Court and won. You know, trying to figure out um, what to do with all of these really ugly stories. <laughs> you know, because the point, uh, especially for those who are not from the South, you know, the, the point is not to kind of reinforce all those stereotypes that one has about South. And, and a lot of these stories certainly do that, <laughs> right? And so then, like, that, I guess that's the sort of a question for you is, is, is you know, how, how, you, how you think it's best to make use of that, but these these hidden stories that that you know you work to to present, um, and, and how how to handle that material that is so difficult to talk about even today still. I certainly think if you if we as a city are willing to erase the embarrassment of those stories and their sort of cultural sins, we're also erasing the beauty of the resistance. And um, just also, uh, that's a great point. And uh, also, if you go around Chattanooga, you'll, you know, and a lot of this I learned from the COA is, you know, most gentrified zip codes in the U.S., um, of course, redlining, uh, bank discrimination, people being pushed out, very segregated neighborhoods, economic segregation. And that, if you just see that now, you're, well, why? And because there's an erasure. And so part of it, I think, is understanding why do these things exist now? And that means looking at the past. And so using the past in a, a positive way to maybe understand what's going on now and how can we um, 
at least make some of the stuff better. We need context and we need better stories. And if you don't have the context of Chattanooga, then folks that are coming in, there's no way that they can adequately understand why 15% of white children are growing up in poverty and 60% of black children are growing up in poverty. There's no context for the massive amount of investment that's going on downtown and, and the increase in jobs and infrastructure in Chattanooga that's happened since the Renaissance started. And actually at that same time, we have stagnant wages. We actually increase in poverty. We've got one of the highest rates of poverty of any city in the country now, 10% above the national average. And that increased during the same time as this investment. You gotta have context for that stuff. How do you understand it? How do you understand what's taking place? The Associated Press just two months ago came out with a major story. I don't know if folks saw it, but Chattanooga and Memphis both, um, between 2005 and 2015, they had one of the greatest decreases in African-American homeownership of any city in the country. 18% increase just recent, in the recent decade. I believe very much in resistance and that folks here in this room can be fighting for a better Chattanooga a more equitable Chattanooga. But part of that is going to include informing ourselves about where we've come to understand where we are.